we are live. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, and we do have a few classes joining us for the first time, uh, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today, it's a little bit of all three, which is really exciting. And all month long, we are highlighting epic Earth, so amazing places, amazing creatures, amazing people from around the globe. It's been a really fun week to kick us off, and we're so thrilled you guys could all join us. So right now, we've got six classes joining us from across North America. I'm going to give them a chance to say hi before we dive in with our speaker. So we've got Miss Holden's grade threes in Spruce Grove in Alberta. Hi guys. Hey, so many of you braving minus 39 temperatures and no buses to get here. We appreciate it. <laughs> we've got Miss Gale's grade five sixes in Charlotte Lake in Ontario. Hi guys. Hi. Hey, the enthusiasm's fantastic. All right. We've got Miss Liz's grade nines in Homestead, Florida joining us for the very first time. So welcome in guys. Hey, I want to know what those little things are. Is that like question period stuff? That's awesome. Okay, we all need little paddles like that. We've got Miss Deer's grade sevens in Chesapeake in Virginia. Hi, guys. Yeah. Hey. hey, welcome in. We've got Miss DeCourcy's uh, grade threes in Wadsworth in Illinois. Hi, guys. I think you guys are just pouring in right about now. Yep, kids are just hey. coming in. Hi, guys. Hey, hey. welcome. <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, we've got Miss Mahoney's grade fours in Trenton in Ontario. Hi, guys. Awesome. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all joining us today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in our house, Denmark, uh, by Dr. Thea Beschoff. She is a she is such a fan of polar bears. She has a PhD in polar bears. And she has spent the last 15 years in Denmark and Greenland, Norway, Russia, Canada, and more, studying and sharing information about this fantastic creature, the largest land predator, one of the most amazing animals on the globe. So you are in great hands. You literally could not have a person who knows more and is more keen to share about polar bears than Dr. Beshoff. Without further ado, I don't want to spoil all our thunder, so I'm going to turn it over to her to blow our minds with all the cool stuff she gets to do so we can learn more about this amazing, amazing creature. So thank you so much for joining us all the way from Denmark and take it away. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Jesse. And thank you everyone for joining in. I am really excited to be doing this. Uh, it's the first time I work with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So uh, yeah, let's do this. And I'm really looking forward to all your great polar bear questions. Uh, so as Jesse may have mentioned, I had a beautiful presentation and a lot of notes. And my hard drive, my, my external hard drive decided to crash uh, very recently this afternoon. Um, yeah, so bear with me, please. Uh, I will be clicking around a little bit more and it may not be as structured as it was originally, but if there's anything that leaves you confused or you wanna hear more about it or whatever, just you know, ask me during the Q and A part of this whole session. All right? Perfect, we're good to go. All right. So, <laughs> let me share my screen. There you go. So, now that I know where you're all from, I can see that I am in a slightly different geographical position than you are. So you're all around the North America in Canada and in the US. However, I am all the way over here in Denmark. Now, Denmark is a part of Scandinavia. I'm gonna zoom in there. I'm at this little red dot. I'm in Aarhus, like Jesse said. Uh, part of Scandinavia, and you know, you probably know us from the Little Mermaid, the Little Mermaid sta statue uh, from Hans Christian Andersen. He wrote a lot of fairy tales. And maybe you also know, because this was what Jesse thought about, was that we are really tall people in Scandinavia. Yeah. Okay. So those are some of the things that people think about. However, we do not have any polar bears. So in order to study polar bears, we need to go north. And that is what I have done. So in the beginning, I didn't really know that I wanted to study polar bears, but I went, hang on, I went to Svalbard, which is this group of islands up here. It's a part of Norway, but it's really, really far north. 
And up here, you have polar bears. So polar bears live all around the high Arctic. Let me just do like this. This is how most polar bear researchers see the world. So here in the middle of the Arctic basin, you have the North Pole. And all around the North Pole, you have polar bears. So you have them in um, the equivalent or in, in Svalbard, which is a part of Norway. You have them in Greenland, you have them in Canada, and you have them in Alaska, so in the US and in Russia. So you really have polar bears all around the high Arctic. And all together, there are like around 25,000 of them. Uh, and that sounds like a big number, but you have to keep in mind that they live very far apart. Polar bears are solitary creatures. They don't really like to hang out with each other too much, apart from you know when they have cubs and when it's mating season. But in their everyday life, they tend to just hang out by themselves and hunt all the seals that they can. And they do that in these 19 different populations. So these are, um, some bears belong more to the Western Hudson Bay population, for example, which is where my cursor is right now. Uh, these bears tend to stay in this particular area that's outlined here. Um, and they don't really tend to meet up with, say, for example, the polar bears from the Laptev Sea uh, of Russia. So they are slightly genetically distinct, but they're still the same species. So there really is only one species of polar bear, but they're spread out all over the high Arctic. And not only that, actually, but also if you go right here to the Arctic basin, you don't really have a lot of polar bears there. And, and that's because in here, in the Arctic basin, the waters are very, very deep. Here, closer to the coast, in this circle of life, if you want to call it that, around the high Arctic, uh, it's much more shallow. Uh, the waters are much more shallow, and that means that the productivity there is really high. And if you have high productivity, like with plankton in the water, that means you have a lot of fish. If you have a lot of fish, you have seals. And if you have seals and sea ice, you will have polar bears. Yeah. So having good sea ice around the high Arctic is incredibly important for the polar bears because, you know, a good polar bear is a fat polar bear. Yeah. Uh, for polar bears, it's all about being as round as possible. And um, they really need the seal fat in order to be that. Hang on, I just want to change it back. Uh, sorry about this. No worries, all good. Oh, there you go. Haha, -ha. hi again. So I just want to say, I do have this little polar bear with me. This is an adult polar bear. You want your polar bears to be nice and fat. And in order to be that, they really need seal fat. There's nothing on land that has the same amount of fat as, fat as, as uh, seals do. And that's why the polar bears need the sea ice as a platform to get out there and hunt the seals. So when you see a polar bear, maybe it's in the zoo, maybe it's in a nature documentary, there are two things I want you to look for to see whether it's a really good healthy polar bear or whether it's maybe a little bit too skinny. So here you have a bear. There are two areas that you need to look at. One is right here, the belly. You want the belly to be nice and round. Yeah, You don't want it to be a completely straight line because that means the polar bear is probably a little bit too skinny. So nice and round here. And then also you look at the rump. You want this to be really nice and round and not this more flat angle. So those are some of the really, really basic things that we look for in polar bears. So how fat the bear is really determines how healthy it is and how well it copes with the times of year where the sea ice maybe isn't there or is in really bad condition because during that time of year, polar bears will be fasting. 
And it's only if the bears are nice and fat before they start fasting that they will continue to be healthy, continue to uh, be able to have cubs and to really uh, for the adult females to be able to nurse their cubs and give them enough milk that the cubs can also survive. So sea ice, incredibly important to polar bears. Um, yeah, hang on. <laughs> uh, share screen again. So now you know what to look for. Hang on. Feel free to, yeah? No, you're good. Oh, okay. All right. So the prop, well, yeah, I don't really have a good thing to show you guys right now to talk about this. So you'll just have to look at me when I was working with polar bear skulls. Yeah. <laughs> this is a picture of me with a very big polar bear skull uh, from Svalbard. It was one of the projects I started out doing when I first started working with polar bears 15 years ago. So like I said, polar bears need sea ice to hunt seals. Um, but the issue is that because we burn a lot of fossil fuels uh, using uh, oil and other black energy sources, then we're raising the level of uh, this thing called carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's a gas, you can't really see it. But the thing is that it forms this blanket around the earth. You know what, I'm just gonna talk to you guys instead. Yeah. Carbon dioxide forms this blanket around the earth. It traps the heat. And so a certain amount of carbon dioxide is really good to have in the atmosphere because it protects us. It keeps the earth at a nice livable temperature. And you know, it's an optimal temperature for life as we know it. However, when we burn these fossil fuel uh, sources, we release extra, we release rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and that thickens this blanket around the earth. And when it does that, it means that some of the radiation, some of the heat from the sun is captured uh, to a much bigger degree than it should be, is captured by this heat trapping blanket. And that means that the temperature on earth is heating up for obvious reasons, because this heat can't get away. And so this heat trapping blanket traps the heat, warms up the planet, and that causes the sea ice to melt. And this, of course, is a problem for polar bears because they're really good swimmers, but they're not that fast in the water, so they can't really catch the seals in the water. They do need that, that sea ice platform as a basis from which to hunt. Um, and it's not just in the high Arctic, the melting sea ice is also causing all kinds of issues in our own backyards, you know, in our own countries, even if we live a lot further south. Um, the high Arctic kind of works as, as the Earth's uh, air conditioner, if you will. So this nice, healthy sea ice is helping us uh, reflect a lot of the sun's rays. And so it helps keep the temperature down on Earth. And so if you remove that air conditioner, if you have dark water instead of white sea ice, it's going to absorb a lot more of the heat from the sun. And it's just going to heat up the planet even more and even more and even more. And that affects the different weather patterns. And, and that means that because the jet stream, because the weather patterns are changing, we also see that, you know, we have more drought, uh, we have more extreme weather events, and all of this, even though it's so far away from the high Arctic, is also tied to the sea ice. Yeah. So really uh, protecting polar bears, it's incredibly important for the bears, yeah, because they're wonderful and magnificent creatures, and I hope you all get to lock eyes with one at some point in your life, if you haven't already. Um, but really protecting the polar bears and protecting sea ice also means protecting life on the rest of the planet. Yeah. 
And Thea, so in 15 years that you've been going to these places to study polar bears, have you personally seen a difference in, in the level of sea ice and the changing habitats of polar bears in these regions? See, the thing is, it's a good question. And it's one I'm asked fairly often. You can't, like we all, ha, how to put it? It is near impossible to tie one observation yeah. to something that happens over decades of time. Yeah. And that's also why sometimes it's a little bit hard to understand. So what you do have to do is to have, you know, you need to monitor what's going on. And that's why it's so important that we have the satellite data, for example, which tells us how the sea ice has been doing uh, in the 80s, in the 90s, and today. And then we can see that trend that shows us that the sea ice is declining. Um, I mean, I've seen all sorts of things, but you can't really tie one particular thing to the fact that, that climate change is happening. That's yeah. fair enough. Um, yeah. A lot of these students, this is the most engaged generation with climate change ever. I mean, people mm -hmm. younger than me are, are marching all over the world for this, uh, but what they don't have is this firsthand experience of getting to these sort of places. So when you're talking about these places that you've studied polar bears, um, this is a, a quite the journey to get to these these expedition sites or these these places where you're studying them and, and researching them. How do you get there and what has this been like for you? So when you, you leave home, what does it take to get to a polar bear research site? Right. Oh, first of all, it takes a lot of patience. Um, polar bear research is logistically very challenging because like I showed you, polar bears live high up in the Arctic and usually there's not a lot of roads. Uh, usually you have to either fly there with a, you know, a plane or a helicopter. So it can be, it can be quite hard just to get there. Um, actually, I do have this, hang on. I'll get the hang of this eventually. Um, so one of the places that I went, Oh, how do I move this there? That I went was up here. If we go back to Canada, so two thirds of the world's polar bears live in Canada. They don't know that, but they do. And one of the places that I went to do field work was up here on Banks Island. Oops. Up here on Banks Island. And I know some of you guys were coming, joining us from Alberta, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so actually I lived in Alberta for four years doing polar bear research because at the University of Alberta, you guys have an amazing polar bear research group. And so I was there doing research. And one of the things we did was we took three or four flights going north ended up up here, took a helicopter and waited until the weather was good enough because you really need good weather to be, uh, you know, doing polar bear helicopter work. And then we went all the way up here to a tiny little cabin, which is called polar bear cabin, which is kind of nice uh, to do some field work. And this is one of the places where I actually do have, hang on. I do have some slides. How about that? So I can tell you guys a little bit about this, if it will. <laughs> oh, if some technology didn't fail, it wouldn't be fun. There, there we go. go. Yeah, good. right? <laughs> so we were up in the high Canadian Arctic on Banks Island. And this is the cabin we were living in. This teeny tiny little thing. So you can see, obviously, there's no way to get there if you don't have a helicopter, right? This is our little cabin, and this is our helicopter. And it's good to have the helicopter close by the cabin because it can get so cold that you need to warm up the battery of, of the helicopter to keep it you know, healthy and that you can have it work working when you need it. Uh, but also, every now and then, polar bears will come by. And polar bears are so curious and they will investigate everything that looks a little bit odd. So sometimes they'll actually, uh, you know, do this jumping action on the windows of the helicopter, and then they'll break the windows of the helicopter, and then you can't go anywhere. So you need to keep a 
an eye out for that. So this is the, the cabin. It's very small. This is me sitting in our dining room area, if you will. <laughs> uh, everything really is, like I wrote here, is 25 square meters, 270 square feet, foot. Um, very tiny. This is the other side. You can see the same table down here that I was sitting at. You can see here that it's a gas stove. So this is where we cook. And also we had to thaw snow for water, right? So all the water that you drink, that you cook with, that you clean with, all of that is snow that we have to melt every day. That's quite a bit, I can tell you. And then of course we have the drying rack uh, over there because when you're out looking for bears all day, sometimes uh, your things get wet. And when it's really cold outside, you really don't wanna be wearing anything wet. This is the sleeping quarters. You don't really have any private life when you're out in a cabin like this. Uh, so this is where we're all sleeping. Uh, there's three of us, the pilot, uh, my professor and myself. And you can also see that we actually put cardboard on the window because it was, when you get to the very high Arctic, you have uh, three months or so where the sun doesn't set. So if you wanna get any sleep in, then you really need to block out that sun during the nighttime. Oh, and then down here on the right, you can see a very fancy bathroom. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can tell, but really it's just a bucket. Um, so it's, it's not fancy when you're doing field work, polar bear field work in the high Arctic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this oh. is what we did most days. Sorry. No, I'm just saying, go ahead. You're, I don't yeah. <laughs> this is what we did most days. This is the sea ice because polar bears love to be in rough sea ice or along leads, like you can see on this picture. Uh, because this is where you'll find the most seals, because this is where the seals can get up and actually take a breath of air. And they're mammals, so they need to do that. And when they come up for a breath of air, or if they even lie out on the sea ice, you know, just basking in the sun, that's when the polar bears can get to them. So we fly around looking for tracks. And once we are looking for dead seals also to see what it is that the polar bears has been, have been eating, when we do find tracks, we go down very low, uh, about 12 to 15 feet above the ice. And then we use a dart gun. It doesn't harm the bear. It's just the way uh, you shoot it into the rump of the bear. And then the, the dart will deliver the sedative to the bear that, you know, it makes the bear go down and not really remember what happened. And then we can set the helicopter down and we can work with the bear. So this is out on the sea ice and the pilot actually, and myself working with this bear, taking a, a lot of different samples. Uh, we also tattoo the bear. So on the inside of the upper lip, each bear has a unique ID number so that if we ever catch it again, we know exactly where we got it last time, how healthy it was, um, whether it had cubs or not. This is me taking hair, hair samples. And then we also write down a lot of notes about the bears. So one of the things we do, for example, is that we note down how fat the bear is, uh, whether it had any injuries, uh, yeah, what it was doing. And of course, if there are cubs, we also look at the cubs. We don't take a lot of samples from the cubs, but we do measure them. Uh, and we take hair samples and we give them an ID number just so that, you know, if we ever get them again, uh, then yeah, we know how old they are and where they were born and all these different uh, variables. Also, little polar bear cubs, they may look cute, but they are feisty, just so you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this one is definitely yelling at me. And it's not because of the way I'm holding it, because that's a very normal way for polar bear moms to hold their cubs. It's simply because it doesn't know me and it did not like it. So when we have these uh, bears in hand, sometimes we give them satellite colors. And that's because then they can give uh, GPS positions that we can download from the satellite and see on our uh, laptops at home. 
And that really tells us so much about the bears, uh, their behavior, and especially in relation to how the sea ice is doing and whether they have cubs and whether it's mating season. So that's really, really good information to have when you need to decide how best to protect the bears. Um, yeah, that doesn't matter. And here you can see some of all the other samples that we take. So sometimes we'll take a tiny little tooth. We use that to estimate the age of the bear if we need to. Uh, we can also take fat samples like biopsies. And that's to look at how much pollution is in a polar bear. Uh, and then we can take hair samples, for example, where we can measure how we can differ a whole bunch of different hormones uh, in the hair. And we can know, for example, how stressed the bear is or what it has been eating. Um, yeah, so we can get all of these quite minimally invasive samples uh, that will tell us a lot about this particular bear. Super cool. Um, yeah. That was fantastic. Great overview of, of one of your research expeditions in the, in the cabin and more. Um, if it's okay with you, we can dive into questions. If there's anything else major you wanted to cover ahead of time, but it'll probably get covered in Q&A anyway. Is it okay if we go on to questions? I want to do just one little one thing, and that's where I want to show you that video. Yeah, let's do Because it. we do a lot of research, um, but one of the things that people don't, a lot of people, don't really think about is how zoos and how bears in captivity can really, really help bears in the wild. So if it's okay with you, I want to play just a little video Let's and you it. can see an example of how this bear in Oregon Zoo helped us develop this brand new method uh, using satellite colors. That's really awesome. And it's taught us so much since then. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, let's see. So here you see a bear's eye view. <laughs> and very shortly, Amy is going to tell us all about this caller. We get a lot of questions about why Tassel is wearing a collar uh, when she has it on. And it, it's part of a research project. We're collaborating with a scientist from the US Geological Survey. And he has a lot of questions about how polar bears behave in the wild. It's very difficult to study polar bears. It's, it's actually notoriously difficult and expensive to get to where they are and directly observe their behavior. So what we've had an opportunity to do here at the Oregon Zoo is train Tossel to wear that collar. What he's putting in there is an accelerometer. And that's similar to something you would find in your smartphone. That's how your phone knows when you're turning it upside down or sideways. And so it's responding to very subtle motions on the bear's part, walking, sitting, uh, even sleeping for long periods of time <coughs> or running. And then the, the researcher can actually videotape her wearing the collar and match the signals that he's getting with the behaviors that Tossel's performing. And when he goes and puts a collar on a wild bear, he can interpret those signals and actually analyze what kind of behaviors the polar bear is doing minute to minute. This model is just a training collar. On a wild bear, the researcher would install a quick release mechanism where they can have the collar fall off once they have the data that they need. Now that she's wearing the collar, we were actually able to mount a small camera on the collar itself to really give people a, a polar bear's eye view. Tassel's really responded well to the training. She's used to spending time with her keepers every morning and learning new behaviors and cooperating with them. Uh, and so this is really just one more challenge for her. And she seemed very interested and participated willingly. Um, I think she's a very curious bear. Seems like she is very interested in all the extra attention she's getting from keepers. And if we can help biologists develop some tools to better and more quickly understand what bears are doing and how they're responding to changes, I really think that's one of the roles of us do. We want to educate our visitors. We want to get them excited about polar bears. We want them to think about their actions in relation to climate change. But we also want to make sure that these animals, when possible, are contributing to the larger base of knowledge about their species. Super cool. It really is. So I just wanted to share that with you, that there are many ways that we can study polar bears. One is to go into the field and collect samples. 
we can work with zoos or we can work with natural history museums. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so, so much, Dr. Beshaw, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, we've got the groups that are live. We've also got a bunch of groups watching on YouTube, six or seven right now, which is fantastic. So if you guys nice. want to type, type in some questions too, I'll, I'll take as many as I possibly can. But let's start by diving in with a question from Ms. Holden's class. If you guys want to kick us off, come on up. Yep. Uh, how many cubs can a polar bear have? Yeah. How many cubs can a polar bear have? Usually, so the average is two, but it depends a little bit on how old the mom is and whether she is nice and healthy and fat or not. Yeah, so if but, she's not fat, will she have one instead? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so generally, yes. Yeah. The skinnier and the younger she is, or hmm, if she's very skinny, fewer cubs, yeah. but also if she's very young or very old, she may also have fewer cubs. Okay, but typically two. Very cool. And yes. you'll see this in a lot of documentaries as well. If you watch polar bear things, they'll often have two babies with them, which is really neat. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Miss Gail's class, if you guys hey, have one. Room. That's you, Miles. Um, so how does the global warming affect the polar bear's hunting pattern and its weight? Great question. <laughs> mm. How does the uh, globe, how does, yeah, well, the sea ice disappearing, how does that affect their pattern, their hunting pattern? Yeah, so when, when they're hunting, has it changed how they hunt based on climate change? In right, the okay. Well, the biggest thing that has changed is that they need to work harder <laughs> Uh, to find enough seals to keep them healthy, to keep them uh, alive. Because the sea ice is disappearing, that means it's not as solid as it was before, it's more scattered. So what we see is that the bears are swimming more and they're swimming for longer distances in order to find the seals. Yeah, just like if you hunted in trees and there were fewer trees around, it would take more, it would be more difficult to find food. And this is something we're seeing with exactly. a lot of animals, but I'm glad mm -hmm. it got brought up so early. Yeah. Bears. But I mean, you just, when you talk about sea ice, you have to think of it as, as a, a habitat loss. So when you think about uh, pandas, if the bamboo disappears, the, the pandas are going to disappear. If the sea ice disappears, polar bears are going to disappear. The problem is that it's really hard to say, okay, we're going to protect this piece of sea ice, you know? Because sea ice moves around and it melts and it comes back. And so you can't really protect it in the same way that you can with a lot of other habitats. Yeah, excellent answer, guys. All right, uh, let's go to Miss Liz's class. Come on up. What's it like being able to witness climate change affect the polar bear? What was the first part of that? Sorry. What's it like being able to witness uh, climate change affect the polar bear? Yeah. That is a really good question. Sometimes it's quite heartbreaking, to be honest. Um, especially if you're on your own and you don't have anyone to talk to about it. I know that there are a lot of people who are very uh, emotionally affected by climate change. And of course, that also goes for people who work in the high Arctic and people who work with polar bears. And that's why it's so important to know that you're making a difference and to know that there are other people who feel the same way that you do out there and that together you can create groups uh, that support each other and work towards you know, this change to use green renewable sources of energy. So really for me, yeah, sometimes it's it's sad, you know, or frustrating, whatever you prefer to use uh, to describe it. But to know that I'm not alone and that we're a lot of people who want to change this, that really helps. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. reach out to other people and do your little part and make sure that we make that swift transition to sun and wind energy and it's all good. 
I've been saying to classes all week long, like this is, it's really interesting that this generation, literally it's not like you guys in the future classes are going to be the ones making the impact. You are the ones making the impact right now. Uh, your voices are being heard in a way that they never have been in history. Mm -hmm. And again, millions, tens of millions of people have marched around the world for this and are already causing, you know, action to take place, yeah. which is fantastic. So it really is in your hands and it's really exciting. It really is. But I think it's so important. Like, I love that the younger generation is stepping up and yelling at adults to actually do something. But I think it's so important for adults to also remember that we are still in this. You know, we have the voting power. So we really need to help the kids. We need to be a part of this whole movement. Yep. Fantastic. Um, all right, Miss Deer's class, if you guys want to come up, go for it. All right. Uh, come on. Okay. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're good. Where did polar bears evolve before spreading through the Arctic? Excellent. Wow, that is a good question. Polar bear evolution is messy. <laughs> uh, so it really depends on where you're looking because they have been their closest um, family member, if you will, is the brown bear or the grizzly bear. And they have been interacting and mating on and off in various places uh, around the, uh, well, around the Arctic, the lower Arctic, if you will. So it really depends on where you're looking. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm so afraid I can't give you, like, we have, there. we found, um, you know, a really, really, really old polar bear uh, jaw in Denmark, for example. Because once upon a time, there were polar bears, well, there were sea ice and seals, and then we had polar bears in Denmark, for example. Uh, we haven't had them in a very long time, but once upon a time, there was, and the same is true for many other places, but as things change, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer it because it's such a messy topic. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's neat, and I love that sort of thing where we ju we just don't know within science what the exact answer is, and that's a uh, you know a testament to the fact that it's yeah, yeah. And, you know always. I mean, yeah. yeah, depending on where you look, the split between the grizzly bear and the polar bear is between two hundred thousand and five million years ago. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite a span. Yeah. yeah. Great question. Um, we had Ms. Reeves' class uh, joining us from Leamington, Ontario. They wanted to come in on Zoom, but they, it wouldn't work. So on YouTube, they wanted to ask, uh, along the Arctic Circle, how many different countries have polar bears? Uh, so there are five countries. There's Norway or Svalbard. Then there's Denmark or Greenland. Um, then there's the US, there's Canada, and there's Russia. Excellent. That was a really fast answer. So I'll take another quick one from Miss Reed's class. Um, where are baby polar bears born? Mm, baby polar bears are born in a den. So with polar bears, it's only the pregnant female that is denning. Every other bear is out there the whole year. It, they don't snooze away like the brown bears do, for example. Um, so the adult females go into a den. They create their own den around. October-ish. And then around Christmas time, they give birth to their cubs. And then they're in this uh, den together with the cubs until March or April. And then they emerge from the den. And by that time, the polar bear female, the, the adult female is hungry. So they get out there and they start heading out to the sea ice and looking for seals so that she can still, you know, have that fat that she can use to make milk for the cubs. So they are in dens. That is where they're born. Awesome. Very cool. All right. We're going to take a few more questions, guys. So Mr. Corsi's class, if you guys have one, come on up. Yes. Yes, we do. You have your question, buddy? Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, how old, how old can, how old can a polar, how is the oldest age a polar bear can be? Mm -hmm. So the oldest polar bear that we know of was a female and she was 42 years old. So that's, that's quite adult, yeah? Even, that's, that's a good middle age for a human. Um, so really they're quite long lived. She was in a zoo though. So she had caretakers. So, you know, when she was feeling sick or whatever, she had vets to take care of her. 
uh, for polar bears in the wild, life is a little bit more rough and so they don't get quite as old. So it's, you know, late twenties maybe. Um, yeah, hmm. we have, you know, in the wild, some people, you know, when we're out with the helicopter and stuff, they have seen polar bears that were in their early thirties, but yeah, late twenties. Oh, and the females usually live a little bit longer than the males because the males spend a lot of energy fighting for the females during mating season. Very cool. I love these creatures where uh, zoos actually provide them such a safe haven and so much care that they live quite a bit longer than they do in the mm -hmm. wild. I think it, it sort of countered a lot of people's expectations about zoos and, and captivity. So I, I like when we can tell mm -hmm. those stories. Yeah. Uh, Miss Lee's class, uh, also joining on YouTube, grade six as in Ottawa, wanted to ask, uh, how do researchers make sure the ID that you use for the bears in the lip is unique? Uh, so we just have a very big spreadsheet, like in Excel on our laptops, <laughs> where we keep track of all of them. And these five polar bear countries that I mentioned a couple of times, they all collaborate. So we all know the different numbers that different countries are working with. So some populations, for example, you have bears that live in that bit of, of ocean or on that bit of ocean when they're sea ice between Russia and the US, for example. And the researchers there collaborate about the bears. So of course, they also share the number information, the ID information that they have about the bears. But basically, the answer is we write it down. Yeah. <laughs> Best database ever. Really? Um, all right. And then last but not least, Ms. Mahoney's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Yeah, go ahead. How big can a polar bear get? Yes, I'm so glad we got that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So in pounds, let's see if it's right, 1,300 to 1,500 pounds. Wow. So pretty big. Uh, they're also quite tall. Uh, I think when they're on their hind legs, definitely taller than me. Uh, let's see, three meters would be what, feet. nine feet? At least 10 feet, a little bit yeah. higher than that. So standing yeah. my legs, double the size of you guys and weighing as much as some of the smaller classes all put together. That's, <laughs> that's a, true. That's a big animal. Yeah. Very that's cool. True. But they're not all that big, but those are like the biggest ones that we know of. So I, I know we could probably go all day with questions about polar bears, but there's something that's really inherently fascinating to people, but we're running out of time. So with that said, mm -hmm. I know you work for Polar Bears International, and I know you work with a lot of polar bear groups. If kids want to find out more about polar bears, where mm -hmm. can they go to learn more about your work, about polar bears in general? Where can they go? Definitely go to our website, which is polarbearsinternational.org. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff there. There's information about what you can do to help us protect polar bears, to keep them around for generations to come. There are lesson plans if you're a teacher. Uh, there are lesson plans. Uh, there are a lot of answers to the frequently asked polar bear questions. Um, and we have all sorts of newsletters that you can sign up for. Uh, we do, I answer a lot of polar bear questions on there every now and then, as do my colleagues, and we talk about the work that we're doing, and yeah, really, I mean, honestly, I mean, I know I'm biased because I work for Polar Bears International, but honestly, it's a really great website, and what's, what really is important to me is that it is all, it all is based on science, yeah, like we're really a scientific organization. Yeah, I, I worked with a lot of organizations in the past, so I can attest to how fantastic they are. I'm going to share that link with all the classes when we're done, and, and hopefully they can type in questions and find out even more. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Thea, what we do at the end of every one of these sessions, I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. And so, boys and girls, if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Dr. Bischoff for joining us today. You are all demuted, and go for it. Thank you. So much. Awesome, guys. Thank you guys so, so much for joining. Uh, I really, really appreciate you guys being here for Epic Earth. Dr. Reshaw, thanks so much for joining us all the way from Denmark today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. All right.